Number 1 Hochelaga the Vanished Village During his second trip to Canada in 1535 Jacques Cartier took to the land that would one day become Montreal which was an uninhabited at the time A First Nations village known as the Hochelaga occupied the area which housed a large population of citizens with at least 50 houses Hochelaga was a thriving community during Cartier's first visit But by the time Samuel de Champlain got to Montreal in 1603, any clue of the village's existence had disappeared. No trace of Hochelaga was found until 1860, when construction work near Sherbrooke and Metcalf revealed that seemed to be remnants of once a large village. John William Dawson did some excavating, but his findings seemed to be of a much smaller village, with the general conclusion being that this was a smaller offshoot settlement. rather than Hochelaga itself some hubbub concerning an area that could house clues to the fate of Hochelaga came about previous year when an office tower was planned to go up on Des Maisonneuve but in truth the amount of times the Montreal area has been built and rebuilt means that any evidence that could point to what happened to Hochelaga is likely lost forever number 2 the place of bonaventure incident on november 7 1990 A woman swimming at the 17th floor place Bonaventure Hotel spots something in the night sky. She sees a round metallic object projecting a series of brilliant light beams. Her sightings set off a chain reaction. She tells the lifeguard, who calls the hotel security guard, who contacts the police and a journalist from La Presse newspaper. The RCMP, the military and even NASA are called in. The aerial phenomena lasts for almost 3 hours from 7:20 p.m. to 10:10 p.m. The incident sparked sensation due to excellent documentation and the large number of very reliable witnesses. Some theorize it is nothing more than the result of northern lights, dismissing the possibility of UFO sighting. The event catches the attention of Bernard Gwinnett, a UFO researcher in Montreal. In 1992, Gwinnett and Dr. Richard Haynes, a former NASA scientist, published a 25-page report on the sighting. The report concludes that the evidence for existence of highly unusual hovering silent large object is indisputable. It suggests some sort of huge physical object about 540 meters wide caused the light but fails to identify its origin. Cited as the most famous UFO sightings to ever occur in Quebec, the Place Bonaventure incident will likely remain a mystery forever. Number 3: Disappearance of Julia Johnson. On 25th April 1928, five-year-old Julia Johnson mysteriously disappeared from outside her home in Winnipeg. Several neighbors saw her prior to that, allowing police to later establish a detailed timeline. At around 2 p.m., Nathan Taplinski, the blacksmith across the street, saw her playing with other children. At 3:50 p.m., neighbor Pauline Crawl looked out the window and spoke to Julia, who asked when Miss Crawl's daughter Elizabeth would be coming home. That was the last time anyone saw Julia Johnson. Just 5 minutes later, Miss Crawl's son walked in and inquired about Julia as her mother was out looking for her. Pretty soon, the entire neighborhood had formed a search party. The police were called in, but it was in vain. Julia wouldn't be found for almost 9 years. In 1937, a disused building near the Johnson's home was being repurposed and a machinist was busy dismantling the old boiler in the basement. Inside the boiler, the worker found the body of Julia Johnson, mummified in the ash. There wasn't much evidence left, and the coroner couldn't even establish if Julia had been murdered or her death had been an accident and someone had hidden the body. Prior to the discovery, police only had one solid lead, a neighbor with a criminal record. After being questioned, he faked his death and tried to escape Seattle. He was arrested in Washington and deported to Canada. where he was questioned again but he disappeared once more this time permanently after julia's body was found police tried to figure out who had access to the building on the day in question building manager john goodwin claimed that he had left a key at the blacksmith shop so that prospective tenants and the meter readers could enter the building hydro meter reader william clark backed up this claim however both blacksmiths denied this somebody was lying but police was never able to prove who and the death of julia johnson still remains a mystery number 4 crooked trees 
About three miles west of Altikane in Saskatchewan is a grove of aspen trees that look nothing like aspen trees should. They are known as the crook trees or the twisted trees and that's exactly what they are. The groove of crook trees, as the name suggests, stands twisted and grotesquely bent out of shape. The aspen's appearance was only noted around the 1940s and many explanations ranging from meteorite to soil contamination has been put forward to explain the strange natural landmark. And what's more weird is that the aspens on the other side of the road grow normally. Some believe that a UFO buzzed by the trees and mutated them, which may not be quite so bizarre as it sounds. When the University of Manitoba examined the weird grove of twisted trees, it found that the aspens were likely connected to underground shoots and the scary shapes are the result of genetic mutations. Think of them like X-Men but without super cool powers. While it's not as romantic as an explanation as the idea that the grove was once home to a group of giant rabbits that fed on the tree's sap and twisted their branches, it's the best we've got. Number 5. The Salt Spring Island Murders In 1868, William Robinson, a resident of Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, was found murdered in his home, shot in the back while eating dinner. He was the third victim in less than two years and all three had one thing in common. They were all black. The first two murders are still unsolved, although it was always presumed that the same person is responsible for all three killings. Officially, the murder of William Robinson has been solved for over a century. An Aboriginal man named Sean Hossett was charged with the crime, found guilty and hanged soon after it was committed. In retrospect, Sean Hossett's guilt seems unlikely at best. Racial tensions gripped the area at the time, and it's not insignificant that Robinson was black, Shauna Hossert was Aboriginal, and the jury that convicted him was entirely white. No one else was ever investigated, in spite of the fact that there were witnesses who testified Shauna Hossert had been with them at the time of the murder. His execution didn't end the conflict either, and eight months after Robinson was killed, Giles Curtis was also murdered in his home. He too had been shot and even at the time people drew comparisons between the two murders. Who really killed these men? And did the murderer die free? While the history books officially consider William Robinson's murder solved, it will likely remain a mystery forever. Number 6. What was in the safe found in the underground room at King and Simcoe? The site of Roy Thompson Hall has in the last 100 years been the location of Ontario's government house and a Canadian Pacific Freight office. Before the development of the downtown railway lands, sidings penetrated as far north as King Street. After a highly controversial land deal was approved in 1976, work began on the Roy Thompson Hall and the surrounding land, which eventually became the home for Metro Hall. Digging the foundation for the music hall to detail plans prepared by the surveyors, workers struck an unexpected wall, behind which was a room directly beneath the Simcoe Street. It was 10 feet square and contained a chair, a table, two empty mugs, and a logged safe. The contents were hauled to the surface. The safe was about 2 feet square and weighed several hundred pounds and suddenly vanished. Workers had planned to crack the safe open but chose to wait. Workers found a similar tunnel under Wellington Street but feared it might collapse if entered. Both spaces were filled in and the safe was never found. Number 7. Jerome the Mystery Man in the Catholic Cemetery of Michigan, in the municipality of Clare along St. Mary's Bay in Nova Scotia, there lies a grave marked by a stone bearing the simple inscription, Jerome. Who was this Jerome? Where did he come from? For half a century, the Acadians at the St. Mary's Bay asked exactly these two questions. On September 8, 1863, a stranger whose legs had been amputated above the knee was found on the beach of Sandy Cove on the coast of Bay of Fundy. Taken in by the local Acadians, he spent rest of his life in almost total silence. People named him Jerome because in the midst of his grunting, he is said to have uttered his name. The families that took him in received an allocation from Nova Scotia government to provide for his needs. People came from everywhere to see the mystery man who was put on show. By the time he died in April 1912, the legend of Jerome had only begun. Over the decades, many people came to know the truth about Jerome. Most believed he was an Italian, a nobleman who had been mutilated for revenge 
and had shut himself away in near total silence for protection from his political enemies or that he was an Italian naval officer who had been injured on the ship and was abandoned because he had become useless. It was often mentioned that he had apparently uttered the words Colombo and Trieste, proving that he was from Italy. But others believed that he was Jeremiah Mahoney, an Irishman who had emigrated to United States and run away from his family. Still others believed that he was a poor lumberjack who had been injured in a logging accident and left to die. Jerome himself never revealed his own story, and who he was still remains. Number 8. Oak Island Money Pit Oak Island is a small forested island in the Mahone Bay of the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada. Since the 1800s, word quickly spread that this island held buried treasure in a pit or a shaft. After news spread of a possible treasure just waiting to be claimed, as many as six men have lost their lives and many more wasted their own fortunes in trying to reach this buried wealth. The Oak Island shaft rightfully earned its name as the Money Pit. An incredibly deep hole of incredibly elaborate construction discovered in 1795. Over two centuries of excavation have unearthed no treasure so far, but what has been discovered is arguably just as fascinating. Underneath the surface of the pit are series of wooden platforms and even deeper flooding mechanisms formed from multiple underground canals leading to water. The first time someone managed to dig deep enough, the entire pit was immediately flooded and due to the construction of the mechanism, it would fill back up with water as fast as you can remove it. At the 90 foot mark, an inscribed encoded stone tablet was found that was revealed to say, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds lie beneath. In search for whatever the island is hiding, the money pit has attracted the attention of hundreds of search parties, including former president Franklin Delano Roosevelt who in his youth spent a summer with fellow Harvard grads in search of the treasure. It's truly a historical oddity, but considering that we are no closer to finding out who dug the pit or why, after 200 years of searching, one must wonder if we ever will. Number 9. Grande Prairie Killings The bodies of two men were found in the ashes of the farmhouse just north of Grand Prairie. A few days later, four more bodies were found in the neighboring farm. They had all been murdered, and the weapon was the same. It started on June 1918. Bodies of Joseph Snyder and his nephew, Stan Lee, were found in the remains of their burnt-out shack near Grand Prairie. Both had been shot, likely with a revolver found near the bodies. The Snyders were quiet and had always seemed to get along well, but 1918 had been a hard year, and the killings were not unheard of. Six days later, after Joseph and Stanley's bodies were found, people noticed a bad smell emanating from the farm down the road. The first bodies were found inside the shack. Ignace Patton, the owner of the farm, lay on the floor beside John Woodward. Both were on their stomachs, close together and fully clothed. A tarp over their bodies, the floor beneath them, was stained with blood. Patton was still wearing the moccasins he had made from the moose skin. Inside a wagon in the yard was Charles Zimmer, his head visible under the sacks of flour and sugar that had been piled on top of his body. Frank Parzikowski was found lying on his back on the log storehouse, one hand in his overall pocket and the other raised over his head as if he was trying to protect himself. Patan had his throat slit but the other three men were shot, a single bullet in the back of the head or in the eye, three men three shots. Suddenly, the deaths of Snyder took on a new significance. The gun found at the burning Snyder shack belonged to Patan, and there were five empty shell casings inside. A ring of keys from the Patan house was also found at the Snyder farm. It has been the belief of the police that either Snyder or his nephew had slain the other and then committed suicide. The last time anyone saw Patan, Zimmer and Witwen alive, they were about to leave for Fort Vermilion to buy a ranch. The men had saved $5,000 for the purchase and had withdrawn all money in cash from the Union Bank in Grande Prairie before their trip. The men also had some wood alcohol and their friend Frank joined them for a drink to say goodbye. After the murders, police found only $108 in the house. The rest of the money was gone. The bills started showing up in September. Once, twos, fives and $10 bills, all stained unmistakably with blood. The money was traced back to Union Bank in Grande Prairie, 
but the teller couldn't remember who the money had come from. Some in town thought the bloody bills could have come from a butcher, but there were just so many of them, all stained the same deep crimson. By the spring of 1920, police still hadn't made an arrest. Even an undercover police officer sent to Grande Prairie came empty-handed. Despite having a long list of potential suspects and a new $5,000 reward, the best detective John Nicholson could come up with was a circumstantial case against Dan Logg, the neighbor who discovered the Snyder's bodies. Nicholson wasn't convinced about the case, especially since there were absolutely no evidence linking Logg to any of the killings, but he decided to charge Logg anyway. The jury took less than an hour to find Logg not guilty. Nicholson then charged another man, Richard Nichtel, with the murders, based on the information he got from Logg. Those charges were dismissed after preliminary hearing. Logg was charged again in July 1921, but the charges were quickly withdrawn. More than 90 years later, the murders of those six men near Grande Prairie remain the largest unsolved mass murder in Alberta history. Number 10. Highway of Tears Less than a year after her 15-year-old cousin vanished, Delphine Nickel was last seen hitchhiking along Highway 16, which runs between Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia. Ramona Wilson, a member of her high school baseball team, left home one Saturday night in June 1994 to attend a dance few towns away. She never arrived. Her remains were found 10 months later near the local airport. Tamara Chipman disappeared in 2005, leaving behind a toddler. Dozens of Canadian women and girls, most of them indigenous, have disappeared or been murdered near Highway 16. So many women and girls have vanished or turned up dead along one stretch of the road that the residents call it Highway of Tears. A special unit formed by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police officially linked 18 such cases from 1969 to 2006 to this part of the highway. More women have vanished since then and community activists and relatives of the missing say they believe the total is closer to 50. Almost all the cases remain unsolved. These are the known victims of the Highway of Tears so far, with the most recent being in 2011 when 20-year-old Madison Scott vanished near the infamous road after attending a party. Police located her tent and truck, but the young woman remains missing. Police have said that eight of the disappearances in particular appear to have been linked and may be work of one individual. Many of the women who have gone missing along the highway live in aboriginal communities and use hitchhiking as a mode of transport, which authorities said could have made them easy targets. Local women have been urged to avoid hitchhiking, though many in poorer communities cannot afford an alternative method of travelling. Despite the terrifying chain of disappearance and murders, the best lead so far came from a 20-year-old woman who escaped an attempted kidnapping in 2012. A man had flagged her down on the side of the road in a Dodge pickup truck with flashing emergency lights blazing. When she got close to him, he tried to bundle her inside, but she struggled free and called the police. She gave police a description of her attacker, an elderly man with long white hair, and they released a sketch of the suspect. But still, no arrest has been made. Previously, in 2009, it appeared the Mounties had got their man. Hundreds of officers raided a house in Isle Prairie, close to Highway 16, following a tip-off. The property was once owned by Leyland Switzer, who is already behind bars for killing his own brother. But a major search failed to turn up anything. Frustrated at the lack of progress in the police case, some families hired private investigators. Yet still the disappearances remain a mystery. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and if you have any suggestions for future top 10, let me know in the comments below. With that being said, thank you once again for watching and I will see you guys next time.